good morning. Good to see all of you here today. Uh, we are excited about the word of God today. I, I hope that you'll lean in. I, I believe that God is really gonna speak something to you. That's gonna be something practical that you're gonna be able to take away with you and be able to walk it out in your daily life. And it's gonna be a great time. We are continuing our series, Deep Roots, and we're looking at Jesus' example and we're growing into the image of the Son of God. You know, that's God's plan and purpose for all of us is that we be conformed to the, the image of the Son of God, that God wants to form Jesus' character deep within you, and he wants his life to flow out of you. The scripture says that rivers of living water are going to flow from within us to the people that we come in contact with, and what a great time that we live in to be a light shining in the darkness. It is a now time as we move into the fall is right ahead of us. I'm not concluding summer yet, okay? We're still going to enjoy it, but kids have gone back to school, and now we're pursuing everything that God has for us, and I believe that he is going to use us now more than ever before. So as you read through the New Testament and you hear Jesus teaching, many times he spoke in parables. Parable, the word parable, it means usually a short fictitious story that illustrates a moral attitude or a religious principle. Jesus would tell these stories. The word parable in the original Greek, it, it literally means to, to throw alongside of. And so it's like Jesus would tell these very simple, short stories that had a very deep and profound impact, and he would throw a life story alongside of this principle, and he would be able to teach you as he's telling this story. And we're going to look at, at probably the OG of all of the parables, the parable of the sower, and it's found in Luke chapter 8 is going to be our main text today, so you can open up your scripture there to Luke 8. Now, parables are different than allegories. Allegories, like Pilgrim's Progress, each of the details of the story illustrate a point. And it's, it's not proper when we're looking at a parable to look at each point and try to extract meaning out of it. What we should do is kind of pull back and look at the big picture of what the parable is trying to illustrate and then really mine into that particular idea right there. The parable of the sower found in Luke chapter 8, and it says... And a great crowd was gathering, and people from town after town came to him, and he said in a parable, in Matthew's account of this, Matthew 13, it says that the crowd was so great that Jesus got onto a boat, let out from the shore a little bit, and he almost used it as a little amphitheater there because the sound would reflect off the water and it would help him to speak to an even greater crowd. So he's teaching the multitudes here. This is something that he wanted the broad audience to grasp. And he said, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, okay, so let me just stop there for a moment. In agriculture in this time period, what would happen is that a farmer would go out and he would throw the seed on the ground first, and then he would till up the ground later, okay? So that's why he's throwing the seed out just on the ground. He's not yet broken the ground up. And it says, as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. We've entitled today's message, Good soil. As we pray today, I want to pray for a few specific things. Let's pray for our children, all of our administrators and teachers that are back in school as of Thursday. Let's pray that this be a great school year, that our children would be taught so many wonderful things, that they have peace, there would be complete safety at all of our schools. And also, I want to pray for Chicago. My wife and I had some family visiting this week, and so we went to the city on Friday, and they're gearing up for the DNC that's happening this week. And uh, there's expected a large number of people pro 
protesting, and we've seen protests get out of hand in recent years. And so let's just pray for our city. We have some police officers that attend our church that are being deployed deployed to the city uh, to, to, to offer protection there. So we want to pray for all of our police officers and all those who are going to be in attendance that there would be peace there. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to your word with expectancy. God, that you are gonna speak and now word to us. Holy Spirit, use my words and my voice, God, to speak exactly what you want me to say to your people today. And Father, we pray uh, for our children and for our teachers and administrators and all of our schools, God, that you'd just bring your protection over them. God, you could build a hedge of protection around each of those campuses. God, that you would protect those students and teachers and administrators and faculty. God, that you'll be with all of the families in our church that are sending their children to these locations to learn and to grow and to develop. God, we pray that godly principles, God, would be instilled in their hearts. God, that they would be raised up under your care. God, we pray your blessing over them. And God, we pray for the city of Chicago, for the DNC that's happening this week, for all of the police officers and those who are there to provide protection. God, there would be peace on this city. God, we pray that peace would reign. God, let there be good things that take place. And God, let a blessing rest on this city this week. And God, we thank you for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, many of you know, yeah, thank you. Uh, many of you know that uh, I grew up uh, in a Christian home, but I've strayed far away from the Lord in my teenage years. And I uh, found myself going to college at the University of Georgia really far from God, uh, using a lot of uh, legal substances and just doing a lot of things I shouldn't have been doing. And, and God got a hold of my heart one night. Uh, it was just, I've been, been doing a lot, uh, been strung out on drugs and uh I just, I just knew God had bigger things for my life than what I was doing, and I was ready to just give it all to him, and I called out to the Lord, and he, he just lifted me out of that miry clay, like Psalm 40 says, and I, I, didn't, I didn't, you know, you, you, you can get right with God, but then everything in your life is still all wrong, okay, and that's a good principle, because you need to know that you can come near to God with all of your stuff, and so I had, I had all of my stuff that I had to deal with, and and I didn't have a place to live anymore. I'd got kicked out of the dorm that I was in. And so I just went and sat in the lobby of that dorm because I didn't know what else to do. I was about four hours away from home. And I, I just sat there kind of not knowing what to do. And across the lobby there, uh, there was a, a, a woman and she had a Bible in her hand and she was reading it. And I just went up to her and I was like, do you have anything from God to tell me? You know, I mean, just can you imagine just an 18 year old kid just coming up to you, strung out on drugs? I mean, you could see that I had not slept the night before. And I was just like, you've got a Bible. Tell me something from God, you know? And, and, and it was an amazing story, a great testimony. Uh, one of the girls from the youth group at the church that I attended as a teenager in Savannah, so we were four hours away from home in Athens, Georgia, uh, they had been praying for me at their Bible study that they'd been doing because she knew that I was doing things I shouldn't have been doing. And uh, they have been praying for me. And so this girl was going to my friend's dorm to be able to have this Bible study. And so I just show up, like this girl brings me up there and I just show up in the room and this girl that I went to youth group with, they've all been praying for me. And so here I am, like a miracle, like an answer to prayer. Like they've been praying for me. Uh, I, had, I had actually gotten arrested with some drug charges and had been put on the front page of the student newspaper called the Red and Black. And so, so they were like praying for this, this drug dealer that was on the front page of the paper. And, and here he is asking for God to do something in the, his life, you know? Uh, so, so just know God can do a miracle in the hardest of hearts. He is a powerful, wonder-working God. And um, so I say that because the word of God has always been something that I've looked to when I've needed direction, when I've needed guidance, when I've needed wisdom, when I've been making decisions, I, I, when I, I, I want to know what I should do with my life. I mean, the word of God has always been the place to go. And here Jesus is referencing how we should treat the word of God in our everyday life. See, the Bible, God's word is the single greatest point of impact in my entire life. And it should be in yours as well. It should rule over every other piece of information that you receive, every other thing that you read or you listen 
listen to or you watch. The Bible should be more than everything else. It should be your guide in life. Second T- uh, Timothy chapter three, verse 16 says, all scripture is breathed out by God. Other translations say all scripture is inspired and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What this needs to tell you is when the Bible tells you something, it is to correct something in your life that's not right. That's how we look at God's word. It corrects us. It trains us so that we're ready for everything that God wants to do in our lives. So we're in Assemblies of God Church. The Assemblies of God has 16 fundamental truths. And fundamental truth number one, the very first one is this, the Bible inspired. The scriptures, both the Old and New Testaments, are verbally inspired of God and are the revelation of God to man. The infallible, authoritative rule of faith and conduct. Why is this the number one? Why isn't something about Jesus number one? Listen, because everything that we believe is found in God's word and we need to make sure that we have a foundation that is we believe that God's word is inspired. It's verbally inspired, which means God inspired all of the writers of the scripture in everything that they wrote down. And so it is God's word to us. People say, how can I hear God speak to me? Read the Bible. It is God speaking directly to you. Now you gotta learn the context of everything because there's gonna be things that are written there and they're written as an example of what not to do. David, he had an affair and he slept with a woman that's not his wife. You, you don't look at the Bible and say, well, David did that, so that's what I'm gonna go to. Now you wanna find the context of it, but you wanna understand that it is God's word directly written to your heart so that you can learn exactly what he wants you to do. This is what we're calling deep roots. We're talking about how we get our roots deep into what God wants to speak in and through each of our lives. He wants to do something deep in you. Bianca last week mentioned that roots serve three primary purposes in plants. Number one, to anchor the plant in the ground. Number two, to absorb the nutrients and to store food. I want you to notice one very important thing that's obvious about roots, and that is that roots exist below the surface. Roots exist below the surface. So what we're talking about in the series are things that other people may not see, but someday through what you've done by getting rooted in God is going to spring up out of you and it's gonna be visible to everybody because the fruit that you bear, it comes from where your roots are located. We're talking about beneath the surface things here. These are things that you and I need to get as discipline in our lives. That we're going to, last week we talked about prayer. That we're going to develop a prayer life. That we're going to have an ongoing conversation with God throughout our lives. That we spend time in prayer. And we also need to spend time studying God's word on our own. I wanna equip you today with an attitude and a mindset that's gonna help you to do everything that God is calling you to do. Now, Jesus in this parable, back with the parable of the sower, we're gonna go back to, Jesus is talking specifically about agricultural practices of the day. And the agricultural practices is that they would throw the seed out and there are four types of soil that he mentions. There's the hard path, okay? That's a a thin layer of soil that's over the top of rock that even though on the surface it looked like it might be able to take root, there's no depth there and so it could not take root. The second type of soil is the, the rocky ground that's there. The rocky, or the hard path, I just described the rocky ground. The hard path is where it's been matted together because everybody's been walking on it and it couldn't even get past the surface. It says that the birds of the air came and ate it up. The thorny soil had all the thorns that were there and it choked out the life of the plant. And then finally he talks about the good soil. 
So at this point, he's talking to this large crowd that's there. He's out on this boat. He's talking to the large crowd that's happening. He gives this big parable, this teaching, but he doesn't give any explanation to all of them. In fact, it takes a little while, even though it's the next verse for us, What's actually transpired is he's now away from the crowds and he's with his disciples personally. And it says this, and when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, to you has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others, they are in parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. So he's now explaining the parable to his disciples. And he says, here's here's what the meaning of this is. When I talked about the sower who sowed his seed, I'm talking about the word of God. And Jesus is saying, I'm the sower and my word is the seed. And now he's turning his attention to the types of soil. He said, the ones that along the path are those who have heard When then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those when they hear the word, they receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while and in time of testing, they fall away. And ask for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that, in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. So he explains this parable to his disciples and not just to everybody. And what's he doing? He's teaching how we hear the word of God. Did you notice in the passage, it says that all the different types hear the word. They all hear the word. Listen, there are a lot of people who are gonna hear the word at this church online, at churches around our community. They're gonna hear the word But there are going to be things that happen afterward that's going to cause the word to not take root and to not produce fruit in their lives. See, the type of soil that you are is all about your hearing. How do you hear the word? There is a spiritual ear that God wants us to have, a spiritual ear that hears during the preaching of the word more than words. What I want you to understand is there is an anointing when the word is being preached for you and for I to listen with more than what's being said because the Holy Spirit is gonna be like this undercurrent in the word and he's gonna be just whispering things to you that have nothing to do with what I'm actually talking about, but you're hearing what the spirit is actually saying to you and you're perking up, your heart begins to race. You understand that God Almighty is visiting you, speaking to you and giving you direction in your life. There's going to be things, I'm not going to talk about divorce today, but there's going to be some people who are struggling with some stuff, and then all of a sudden, it's just going to be like, you're going to get this terror terror upon your life. A a holy fear is going to come over you, understanding that the mindset that you've been having about your marriage has been leading you down the wrong thing, and you need to get corrected about that and get back on God's path with what God wants you to do. Listen, this is how the Holy Spirit gives us ears to hear. Listen to what verse 10 says again. He says, to you has been given the secrets of the kingdom of God. For others, they're in parables that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. The word understand in the Greek is sunimeimi. Okay, there you go. Uh, To set or bring together, to put, as it were, the perception with the thing perceived to set or join together in the mind to understand. So what he's saying here, look at verse 10 again. He says, hearing they may not understand. He's saying that there's an understanding that comes when the Holy Spirit puts together in your understanding what is being communicated. Another Bible dictionary says that this word understand means to realize to the point of insight, 
to be intelligent or the capacity to understand. So look at verse 10 again. He says that, or here's, here's another way that it's used. It's used in Romans chapter three. Paul is laying out a case right here that everybody needs Jesus. There's nobody who could be saved without Jesus. And he's laying it out. He says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in this whole uh, passage here, he says, there's none righteous. No, not one. No, no one understands no one seeks God. No one has this spiritual understanding apart from God. So all of us are lost. All of us have nothing that we can contribute to our own salvation. We need the Holy Spirit to give it to us. So look at verse 10 again. He says, in hearing they may not understand. That's what that Greek word, soon ea me, okay? That's what it means. It means that we get the spiritual understanding. We have a, a, a listening ear to what it is that God wants to hear, t- tell us. So, so here's the question I want you to ask yourself. How do I ensure that I'm not just listening, but I'm also understanding? How do I increase my hearing IQ to where I can really hear what God wants to say to me? And it's very simple. There's a key that unlocks this, okay? This is the key that is gonna unlock your Bible reading, your Bible study, and your life is going to be transformed. James gives it to us very clearly. He says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. There it is again. The word's a seed. Receive. Receive it, receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And here's the key, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. You wanna be an understanding spiritual truth? You have to be a doer of the word. You have to put it into practice. If you're not applying God's word to your life when you hear it, if you just hear it and say, that's good, preach it, say it again, pastor. I'm gonna throw my shoe at you, it's so good, okay? If you say all of those things, but then you walk out of here and act the exact same way that you've always acted, you are going to deceive yourself into thinking I'm good because I did church today. It's not good enough. I have to put it into practice. My pastor would say, I have to put it into shoe leather. I gotta walk it out. I have to live it in my everyday life. It's not something I can just say at church. I've gotta go and walk it out everywhere that I go. As I parent, as I'm married, as I go to work, as I go to school, as I go shopping, whatever it might be, I've gotta live out what God has been working in me. It's really easy to say it here because you're hearing it. And for some of us, we we get a little bit of seed in us, but because we're rocky, because we have no depth, it doesn't take any root and we walk out of here and it does not have any effect on our lives. And so James says, be doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at at himself and goes away at once and forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. As you do it, you're going to be blessed. Not as you hear it, as you live it out, you've got to apply it to your lives. So what's the key to unlocking everything Bible-related? Put it into practice. Do it. Walk it out. Live it out. Let God's word become a part of your life so that you're living in accordance with what he's saying. Because if not, you're not going to have any spiritual understanding and you're going to deceive yourself thinking that you're somewhere where you're not because you haven't received it the way that he wants it to. If if you're in Luke 8, you're reading the parable of the sower, if you drop down just a little bit further in the passage, uh, past that parable, it has an occurrence where someone says, or Jesus says, take care how you hear, for the one who has, more will be given, and the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. What does this mean? Jesus says, take care how you hear. So he's saying, heed very carefully how you hear. What would be something that you could do to take care about how you're hearing? One one way is to take notes while someone's preaching. Take notes, write it down. 
Type it down your phone. Follow along with the notes that we have typed up here for you on your app. That's one way that you can be careful about how you're hearing because you're writing these things down and you're remembering them. I take notes every single week and I'm the one who types all this stuff up. And so Bianca's preaching last week and I got a full page of notes. I don't have to do that. I have all of her notes. I could ask her to provide her notes for me. But for me, it helps me when I'm writing it down. It helps me remember it. For you, it might be something else. But I want to make sure that I'm being obedient to the word. It says, take care how you hear. So I'm going to make sure that I'm being diligent in how I hear. How, how else? Well, it's a heart attitude, a heart posture. I'm going to take care because I want to make sure that I'm falling under the authority of the word. So I'm going to have a very respectful and honoring posture towards hearing the word. I'm going to be eye contact, man. I'm going to be listening. I'm going to get a good night's sleep on Saturday night. So when I come on Sunday, I'm not like, you know, struggling to kind of stay awake, man. Saturday night is like a sacred place in our household. Like, like we, we say Saturday night, we try not to do anything because we're, we, have, we have church the next day. God's word's gonna be preached and we wanna make sure we're all having receptive hearts ready to receive. You know, as our children have grown up, you know, they've sat in church services. And so, you know, they, sometimes they doodle and do stuff. And so we're like, hey, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. What's that? Take care of what you hear because, listen, he says, for the one who has not, even what he has is going to be taken away. What does that mean? Because if you're a person who's not taking careful hearing, which the seed's gonna be taken away. The birds of the air are gonna come and, and snatch it up. The, the devil's gonna come and take it away from you. He's gonna take away that revelation because you're not listening carefully. And so even what you have been given is gonna be taken away from you. But the one who has, even more will be given to him. What does that mean? Even more is gonna be given to you because, because you're gonna get this revelation and then you're gonna apply it to your life and then you're gonna produce fruit. And so you're gonna have more because that fruit is gonna come out of your life because you've been attentive to what the word of God has been teaching us. It's very important to understand this. In, in verse 12, same, same text here, verse 12, we're kind of backtracking a little bit here. It says, the ones along the path are those who have heard and then the devil comes in and takes away the word from their hearts. So, so the one who has not, even what little he has is gonna be taken away from him because, because they, they can't believe and be saved because the devil's taken it away from them. The first soil is those who think they have the word, but the devil snatches it away. The, the second soil, verse 13, the ones on the rock are those who hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, it's taken away from them. See, they think they have the word with true spiritual faith and joy, but they have no root to sustain them during trial. And this is a superficial enthusiasm that makes it to where they're only able to deal with fair weather days. And so when trials come, they, what they think that they have is taken away from them. Verse 14, he says, the third one is the th ones that fell among the thorns. Those are the ones who hear, but as soon as they go on their way, they're choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life and their fruit does not mature. It's what they have is taken away from them. the third ones. They think that they have the word of God, but the worries and riches and pleasures come and then they fail to bear any fruit. And the fourth soil, the fourth soil we read very clearly that those who have this fruitfulness that come out of their life. In verse 15, it says, and those that in good soil, those are the ones who hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and they bear fruit with patience. This is what God wants for you and I. He wants fruitfulness. That's why we're careful when we teach here. We're, we're trying to say, yes, God's promises are for you. He's not against you, okay? But he doesn't promise that your life is just gonna be peaches all the time and everything's gonna go so well and you're gonna be blessed and your family's gonna be blessed. Listen, there'll be times where you go through some difficulty and you need to understand that God's plan and purpose for you is fruitfulness in every season, not for you just to have peace all the time and everything to go well. It's so that you can deal with life head on because you've got the word that's been stored up in your heart and you have deep roots that keep you planted firmly. When there's a storm blowing, your leaves are blowing around. Sometimes you're gonna lose a branch or two here or there, but you are going to remain and cause you to be even more fruitful because that's what God's purposes are. Same passage, Luke chapter eight, we just dropped down to verse 19 and it says, then his mother and brothers came to him. 
but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. So what he's saying is the relationship that you have with Jesus is going to become even more close than a family relationship when you obey the word of God. Jesus underscores this and says, yes, family is important, but I'm telling you, the way you get close to me, the way you get really close to me is to listen to my word and obey me in everything. Obedience is the key that unlocks this. In Luke chapter 11, he says, and he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the woman that bore you and the breast at which nursed. Okay, that was my best, that was my best woman in the crowd. <laughs> but he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. He's saying it's more of a blessing to be a person who hears God's word and puts it into practice than even being Mary, his mother. Commentator John Trapp says his disciples were more blessed in hearing Christ than his mother in bearing him. Wow, that's important. That's, that underscores how much Jesus says it's important to get your roots deeply rooted in the word of God. Listen, the word of God is powerful and life-changing, but it only can flourish in a soft, receptive heart that's free from the cares and distractions of this world. When we come into this sacred place and open up God's word together, we forget about everything that's happening out there, and we listen to what God is saying to us because it is the most important thing. Each of us must ask ourselves, what kind of soil am I? What kind of soil am I? Am I the hard path? where the word is quickly taken away? Am I the shallow soil where I fall away during testing? Am I thorny, choked by cares, riches, and pleasures? We've gotta be honest with ourselves. I tell you, there are times in my life where I am definitely thorny, where, where cares of this world choke out what God wants to do in my life. My concern for riches and things begin to choke out what God wants to do in my life. There are times when I'm seeking pleasure and I'm just kind of like, well, I'm on vacation. And man, it just chokes out what God wants to do in my life. I don't know if you could be honest with yourself like I'm being honest with all of you right now, but I'm telling you, you need to look at it and say, where am I at on this scale? Am, Am I in any of these things? And how do I repent? And how do I get out of it? How do we know where we're at? By our fruit. Maybe you got a lot of anger right now. Maybe you got lust going on. Maybe there's envy and desires that are outside of the will of God. You're gonna see that fruit in your life and you're gonna say, oh, there it is. It's showing me what kind of soil I've got right now. It's showing me how I'm letting the seed of the word of God get planted in my heart. Luke chapter eight and verse 15, look what he says. As for that in the good soil, They are those who hearing the word hold it fast in an honest and good heart and they bear fruit with patience. The fruit we bear is a testament to what kind of soil we are. Listen, a life that is deeply rooted in Christ will supernaturally produce good fruit, visible, beneficial, and in kind with Jesus' character. We're gonna be just like him. It's gonna be the things that spill out of us because we've got that kind of seed within us. God's word, he he fertilizes your heart soil. It it just, it, it not only is the seed, but it's the fertilizer that just makes you so rich and vibrant and full of life. Reading and studying the Bible regularly on your own is a imperative if you wanna be a disciple of Jesus. You've got to read things like when Jesus said, if you want to be my disciples, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. It's imperative that you confront your flesh with these ideas and say, I need to get more like Jesus. Finally, we come to the end here and I want to kind of wrap up with just a few last ideas here. The first thing is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 3 verse 6. It says, I planted, Paul's writing this, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. It's God who brings the growth. It's not 
men and women who bring the growth. It's God. Yes, you're gonna hear something from God's word as I speak it today, but it is not me. It is not my power. It's not my persuasive words or my funny stories that are gonna produce anything in you. It's going to be God himself bringing the growth. Paul says, I planted because he preached the word. Apollos came and continued to teach, but he says, God's the one who brought the increase. God gives supernatural growth. So I wanna look just one last time at this parable in verse 11. The seed is the word of God. That's what he says. He says, here's the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Seeds are really important, you know that? Seeds have some very special powers to them. It's if the seed is the word of God, Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, for the word of God, the seed is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, of the discerning of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Doesn't get any more plain than that. God's word sees everything about you, he reads you. So we're not just reading the Bible, we're letting the Bible read us. That's what it says right here. But notice it's living and active. Seeds contain life in them. Do you know how powerful seeds are? Seeds can sprout hundreds, even thousands of years after they've been stored because of the life that is contained in a seed. God's word is alive because there's life in it and it will speak to your heart and produce joy in you. I I love, listen, as painful it is to read the Bible sometimes, I love the clean, healthy feeling you feel afterwards. You know, my, I, go, I go work out in the yard, get all hot and sweaty, and I come and take a shower. Man, there's nothing like feeling that good, clean feeling, putting on nice, clean clothes, sitting down on the couch, not all sweaty and stuff. That's what you feel like after you get done reading the Bible. You feel like you just took a shower, and you're clean. You put on some clean clothes, and you're like, man, I feel refreshed. There's so much joy in me. But, but God's Word contains so much life. Listen, I told you about the seeds, right? This right here is a date palm. It's a Judean date palm. They found some seeds that were 2,000 years old and they germinated these seeds. And this tree right here is named Methuselah after the oldest person found in the Bible. And you can go into Israel and you can see this right now. And it was grown over 2,000 years of being stored in a storage facility. Can you, I mean, think about this. God's word contains so much life. It's a seed. It contains so much life. It's living and active and it's gonna get involved in your life when you allow it to do it. God's word is gonna work in you. Jesus said in Matthew 13, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that man took and sowed into his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown larger than all the other garden plants, it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. What am I gaining here? I'm gaining the fact that when I get the seed of God's word in my life, it can produce so much more than I could ever imagine. So much more that's gonna go into a whole tree. Birds of the air are gonna land in it. And it was the smallest of all the seeds that was happening there. Listen, God might speak a very small detail to you through his word. He might be like, you've got a prideful mindset in this particular area, in this deal. I've, I've been reading my Bible and I've had to call or text somebody during that time to ask for forgiveness It might be something small, but you're saying, I've got to put God's word into practice. I've got to be a doer of what God's telling me to do. I need to go and do it immediately. Here's what I would tell you. If God's speaking something to you in his word, go and do it immediately. Don't wait. Oh, I'll get to that. I'll do that some other time. I'll call call that person and I'll make some things right. Go do it now. Stop what you're doing and go obey what God. Obedience produces more revelation. Listen, you might be hearing just God speak something small to you. See, the myth of spiritual growth is that you need to have some massive thing happen in your life and it's just gonna be this thing. No, spiritual growth many times is just one obedient act after another, all strung together and then pretty soon you find yourself in a completely different place spiritually because you've been listening to everything that God has said to you. Many people give up on faith. 
They give up on faith completely because they're in a habit of not obeying God. They've not been deepening their roots. And then they just walk away saying, ah, well, it just didn't work for me. That didn't work for you because you've not been obedient. There's a movement right now on people online that are calling themselves ex-evangelicals and they're sharing their testimony of how they deconstructed their faith and when they realized that there was nothing there they just decided to walk away from God completely and now they're so enlightened because they've reached this place of nirvana on their own and I'm saying that's foolishness people don't 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 fall into a trap of some deceived person who's deceived themselves because they haven't obeyed God's word and then they've just decided to spread their their pollution on the internet and somehow you've discovered it and now you're gaining this revelation. No, repent and believe on the gospel so that you can be saved. It is really clear what we need to be doing here. We've got to dig our roots down deep. We've got to understand that even though it's small, God can do something massive. Even a small truth that God reveals to you in his word, if you obey, has the power to transform your life. God's word is tra transforming when you put it into practice. When when you start believing it, things that are wrong in your life right now, you might have marriage problem, you might have some other kind of problem, and you're like, man, start obeying the word, those small little things, and watch how God begins to refurbish, re replenish everything that's been wrong. It's amazing what obeying God's word will do. Isaiah 55, he says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish everything which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God says, my word is potent. It is always effective. 100% effective, okay? Like, I'll, I'll give you an infomercial on this if I need to, okay? I'll get testimonials. We'll hear from callers, okay? Like, it works. God's word produces what it needs to in our life. Listen, God will accomplish his purposes in your life if you allow the seed of his word to become activated through your obedience. And that's what I want you to understand. God's word, it, it will stay stored up and dormant until you activate it by obeying him and doing what he's telling you to do. Put it into practice. You, you want deep roots? You wanna grow deep in the things of God? Obey what God says to do every time. Watch your life get transformed and watch what he does. God's word will do more than you can imagine if you would allow him to have a moment. I wanna pray with you right now. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Just take a moment to reflect on what's been said. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're watching online and you're saying, Pastor, I'm not right with God. I need Jesus to forgive me of my sins so I can be born again, so I can walk with him and experience the life that he provides. If you're here today saying, Pastor, I need to be born again. I need to be saved from my sin. I need to make sure that I know Jesus, that he's written my name in the Lamb's book of life and that I'm gonna spend eternity with Jesus. If you're here today and you wanna pray and ask God to forgive you and to wash you from all unrighteousness, I want you to lift your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Three, all across this room. Yes, yes. Anybody else? Just lift your hand up. Maybe you're watching online. You lift up your hand too. Okay, you can put your hands back down. Can we pray this prayer out loud after me? Let's repeat it so that we can encourage those who may be praying it for the first time. Say, dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God, that you died for my sin so that I could be saved, so that I'd be free from your judgment and I would have your grace. God, forgive me, wash me, and give me a new start. I'll follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, praise God. He's doing a work in here, he's doing a work in here. He's doing a work, listen, if you just prayed and gave your life to Christ, make sure you tell somebody. You can text the word Jesus or you can find one of our prayer team members at the conclusion of this service. I want you to all stand up with me. We're not gonna be dismissed just yet, but I, I want you to stand up and I want us to 
do one more thing as we, as we pray together. I want us to pray that we would be obedient to the word of God. God's been speaking some things to some of us and we've been going our own way for too long, disobeying him and disregarding his instructions on how we ought to live. And so I want you to humble yourself again before the Lord, bow your head and I want you to take a moment. I want you to reflect on your relationship with God, on your relationship with the word of God. Are you allowing it to guide you, to instruct you, to correct you, to train you? Are you just kind of adding it as a accessory, a part of your life? It's really not essential. It's just something I put on on Sundays. I put on when it looks good, but it's not something I've let take root in my heart. Be honest with God. Be honest with yourself. We're not gonna have anybody lift up their hands. We're not gonna have anybody walk to the front. This is just between you and God. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we reflect on our relationship with you and specifically our relationship with your word, God, I pray that we would live underneath the authority of your word. God, that children raised in these households that are bringing, their parents are bringing them to church every week. God, I pray, God, that the word of God would be implanted into their hearts, producing fruit from an early age. God, I pray for all of us, God, that we would hear your word and be doers of your word and not deceive ourselves. Father, would you continue to grow us into disciples that follow you closely? And God, we thank you for this time together. And God, as I say a blessing over your people right now, God, would you bless your people? Would you keep them? God, would you make your face, your countenance shine upon them? And God, would you bring them peace? God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our prayer team is gonna come to the front right now. If you need prayer for anything that's going on in your life, you wanna talk to somebody, maybe God's stirring your heart right now. It's a great time to just pause, to to come to the front. Some of you may just wanna kneel here and just get some things right with you and God. Uh, We're gonna leave the altars open and just ask you if you you could just quietly dismiss if you're gonna stay in the room. But if you wanna stay and worship and pray, I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, Have a great week and we'll see you right back here next Sunday. God bless.